Surrogacy is an arrangement of assisted reproduction whereby a woman consents to carrying the pregnancy of an intended parent or parents. In Namibia, there is currently no legal framework around surrogacy, so it is often not discussed publicly. However, recently, questions have surfaced as to how surrogacy works, what exactly it is, and why somebody might opt for this form of reproductive technology. Does the child born through surrogacy carry the DNA of the intended parents, or does the child carry the DNA of the surrogate? How might being a child born through surrogacy affect the psychology of the child? This and many more questions will be addressed on this week's episode of Heartbeat. Good evening and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Arlana Shikongo. It's another Wednesday and it's another episode of Heartbeat. Today we'll be discussing surrogacy. So we'll be joined by a reproductive medicine specialist, Dr. Olufemi Oloragan, who is from the Cape Vintuk a fertility clinic, which is one of the few facilities in Namibia that offer reproductive medicine services. Uh, we'll also be joined by Guillermo Delgado, who has built his family alongside his partner uh, through surrogacy, and they'll be di- he'll be discussing with us the process, um, how they went about it, and the intricacies of, of using this mechanism to start a family. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Doctor, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, let's just quickly try to get this uh, sorted out. Our doctor is joining us via Zoom, and as it always goes with technology, there seems to be a little bit of a glitch, uh, but we will sort that out shortly. Uh, but while we do, um, Memo, I'll start off with you. If you can just... <coughs> Um, talk to us a little bit about um, your own experience with surrogacy. You now have three uh, young children, a young son and two baby girls. Um, so you've, you've gone through this process twice, essentially. Um, so just tell us a little bit about um, what your experience with surrogacy was. So, uh, yes, I think uh, our experience with surrogacy is grounded on our desire to become parents. Um, I'm in a sex, um, same-sex relationship, so I'm married to a Namibian man, and yeah. So we, firstly, we we explored what made at the time more sense to 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 us, which was adoption. However, um, at that time, in the in 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 when we were discussing this, it became clear that. Uh, in Namibia, only one would, one of us would be recognized as mm-hmm. parent. So we did not uh, feel comfortable with that. Uh, that made us feel like one is the parent and the other person is, you know, mm-hmm. a second, um, just an, anything but not the parent. Mm-hmm. So we then, um, that's when we um, explored the um, avenue of surrogacy. Mm-hmm. So. Um, our journey basically started with uh, an info session that was organized in Cape Town. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a little bit of background is that we were living uh, here in Namibia, but also uh, very much um, uh, going often to Cape Town because mm-hmm. I was then doing my studies, my PhD in, in, in Cape Town. So during one of our trips, um, there was an information session about surrogacy organized by um, a a legal firm, Mm -hmm. some fertility clinics in South Africa. And there is where we um, discovered that surrogacy was an option for us. And Mm -hmm. I can give you a little bit more details, but essentially it was an option for us Mm -hmm. uh, as a same-sex couple that would um, to do this uh, process in South Africa. Mm-hmm. That's because the process that we did 
we were able to do it in South Africa specifically because Philip is also a permanent resident in South Africa mm -hmm. that allows him to basically access these mechanisms. But perhaps things have changed now. Mm. But uh, for us at that time, that was the, what allowed us to access this mechanism. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully the doctor can tell us more about that. Mm -hmm. Doctor, you. you still can't hear us. I'm not too sure... Um, what that's about. Uh, let's just take a moment to give the technical team an opportunity uh, to get the doctor in so that we can hear him and he can hear us because, um, as I said, doctor is a reproductive medicine specialist. So he'll be giving us some in insight as to what exactly surrogacy is, the different types of surrogacies, um, what the medical process of, uh, of surrogacy is during pregnancy, um, which, of course, will give people a better understanding of um, the mechanisms that are are at play when um, somebody opts, opts to have a child through surrogacy. Uh, doctor, can you hear us now? Mm, seemingly not yet. I see that also, okay. Um, Guillermo, I think um, let's just go on until the mm -hmm. tech team sorts it out uh, for the moment. I don't think we can do anything from our seats right now. Um, but how did you find the surrogate? How? What was that mm -hmm. process like? So uh, maybe here is where maybe we can differentiate between uh, the surrogate, the person that carries the child, mm -hmm. and then the egg donor. Uh, as we are, where as we are two men, mm -hmm. we needed. Um, to uh, we needed an egg donor mm -hmm. now uh, the egg donor process or finding an egg donor is done through um, well organizations in South Africa that specialize in that mm -hmm. uh, the legislation does not um, allow us to ever be able to meet the egg donor is an anonymous process okay so the selection process ensures that you never have access to to who is that person mm -hmm. you only get certain characteristics and certain information uh, of the of the donors and then uh, you basically the organization mediates between yourself and the eventual like, donor mm -hmm. until yeah the match is made and then the process of egg donation takes place so that's more kind of institutionalized mm. on the other hand the process of finding a surrogate happens in a more informal way uh, there are networks uh, of uh, of potential surrogate mothers mm -hmm. that then um, that then uh, you know can uh, eventually prospective parents can can make themselves known mm -hmm. and then the process of basically uh, engagement starts mm -hmm. but that's really um, a process uh, directly between the parents and the eventual surrogate mm -hmm. uh, that it's very much just up to these two parties to 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 consolidate. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky. We actually m m um, met the the first uh, couple that we met. Uh, uh, that um, because um, also as a background, a surrogate uh, and in the current framework needs to needs to have at least uh, a kid of her own needs yeah. to be economically stable must have a support network so uh, in that case uh, our surrogate is in a happy marriage with three kids okay. and we met them uh, and the match and, and, and it was it was it worked the first time so we um so th in in our case we were uh, we were very lucky and the first person that we met was uh, the person that we eventually engaged mm -hmm. in the process of surrogacy and it was the same uh, surrogate mother for twins okay uh -huh. all right i was actually going to ask about yeah. that um and then also why you chose to use the same surrogate mother rather than <laughs> finding someone new well that was a miracle okay. i mean just a few um weeks if not days after our first born uh, um, came to this world <laughs> the 
then uh, the surrogate said in passing that she would do it again. Oh. Uh, she didn't say it to us, but she said she would just do it again. Mm-hmm. At that time, Philip and I said, wow, well, um, we, uh, considering that the process is a long process, a very taxing process, mm-hmm. uh, you could see it because we were very much in touch, very, very involved in throughout the process, so we could see all the all the efforts that mm-hmm. went through this so we said like we were incredibly grateful but mm-hmm. we didn't have let me put it this way we didn't we said like we, we would never be able to ask this from somebody again mm-hmm. ever and then when uh, the surrogate uh, mentioned this then philip and i didn't hesitate to say if she would do it again whether mm-hmm. she would do this again for us and she said yes so that was when the magic happened and then uh, we earlier this year. We gave birth to twins earlier this year. Mm. And uh, I think that much basically the whole country knows about uh, because <laughs> the entire your entire process with both uh, sets of children has been something that has is quite a landmark um, in this country and I'm sure that our audience is aware um, that uh, your son recently got his citizenship granted uh, by the high court and um, that's been something that you've been fighting for quite a while so that it I think it, it was exciting news for everyone uh, that was following following the case um, in any event, though, <laughs> we're not here to come talk about law. We are here to talk about health. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to the surrogate, how um, responsible are you as the intended parents for the health care, the costs of the health care, um, how she's taking care of herself? How responsible are you? So uh, the the framework in South Africa is very solid mm-hmm. uh, and it is um And it protects both parts. So uh, the commission and parents are the ones responsible for every expense. Mm -hmm. And it is a, but it is also a not-for-profit kind of um, endeavor. Mm -hmm. So for instance, differently from other countries, like for instance, the UK or perhaps, well, I'm sorry, I don't know the UK, uh, like the US, sorry, Mm -hmm. or other places in Asia where, uh, the surrogates would be remunerated. In in the case of South Africa, these the 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 only thing you can do is to reimburse expenses. Mm. So it's more is mainly kind of reimbursing um, all the kind of um, eventualities that one undergoes when one is pregnant. Mm. Uh, of course, that also I mean healthcare provision and everything is on the parents uh, to cover. But there are recourses for that, such as insur- temporary insurances and so on, that have a cost but would be less than paying medical expenses mm. uh, straight out of the pocket. So, um, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I think let's see if the if doctor can hear us. Doctor, can you hear us? I can hear you now, yes. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. So sorry for the technical difficulties, um, but I'm happy no to sort it out now. I, I'm guessing if, if you couldn't hear us, you didn't catch too much of the beginning of the conversation, did you? No, I missed the early parts, but I, I got a little bit of what uh, Lemo was saying just now, but I missed the early parts of the conversation. Okay. Um, he was really just filling us in as to um, the process that him and his partner went through uh, in South Africa uh, between the egg donor and choosing um, the surrogate mother and the differences between the two, uh, which I think will also come up when we talk about the different types of surrogacy. Um, but I think that for to start us off, where, where we actually meant to start was Dr. Doctor, if you could just tell us, tell the public what exactly surrogacy is. <laughs> it actually seems like the technology today is not letting us talk to the good doctor. Um, but uh, let's just give that a moment. Okay, there we have it. Can you just switch to perhaps 
Sri Lanka. Yeah, go on, go ahead. So okay. you said you were, it was filling you in about what happened in South Africa. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, and the process right. that they right. went through right. between um, uh, finding, you know, having an egg donor and then identifying um, a surrogate mother to, to carry the pregnancy okay. for them and then um, the legalities around how the process works in South Africa as well. Um, but before we get into that or go on with that, I do want us to just um, give the audience some insight as to what surrogacy is. So, Doctor, if you could please explain to us what sure. exactly surrogacy is. Sure. I mean, it's probably as, as most people would have sort of imagined it is. It's basically um, someone else carrying a pregnancy that does not, that she is not going to be the parent of. Mm -hmm. So it's a third party sort of pregnancy. So in other words, you're carrying the pregnancy uh, for someone else, for another couple, or for another individual. That's that's the that's the simplified way of putting it. There are two types, though. You can have just a gestational carrier, which means that that person has absolutely no genetic component to that um, so to that pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Or you can have true surrogacy or traditional surrogacy, which often means that. You are going to use that person's egg and then she's going to carry the pregnancy as well. Mm. So in the true surrogacy, you, you're basically using, she'll probably be a donor of an egg mm. as well. While with gestational carriers, the eggs come from somewhere else, either from a different, either from a donor or from one of the recipient parents mm. of that um, of that pregnancy. So those are the two types, to the, the two broad types of surrogacy you have. So essentially, it just means that the pregnancy that is being carried by the by that um, gestational mom mm. is being carried for another couple or being carried for somebody else. Okay, so then by definition, that would mean um, Guillermo that your yours was a gestational um, surrogacy. Yes, it was. Okay, <laughs> all right. And Just then, not carry it. Okay, all right. Um, and then you know, usually what we do uh, when we come up with these topics is we go out into the street and uh, we ask people a couple of questions just to see what they know, what they understand, um, and where the gaps in knowledge are. So we're going to play some of those vox pops that we collected and hear from the public about what they know. need extra help to bring a baby into the world. This is when they use an, a third partner, a donor, or volunteer to carry their baby, which is generally a female. <laughs> I know that surrogacy is when a family gets a third party to have a baby, be it by one, let's say for example, a mother who's unable to reach a certain trimester of her pregnancy, so she decides to donate one of her eggs to be um, fertilized and carried by another woman or just having another woman donate one of her eggs and you know birth the baby. Surrogacy is the process of a woman that carries somebody else's baby. The DNA generally consists of all three parents. Biologically I'm not a hundred percent sure but if it's from a donor egg from the mother of the baby then I feel like she carries the DNA of the mother but at the same time you know the through the umbilical cords and all those renal cords in the abdomen in the female body 
blood is somehow shared because nutrients are transferred from the mother to the child. So I would say that they do have both the surrogate and the mother in that case. Uh, some of them are implants. Né? If it's an implant where there's already an embryo and it's been planted to that host, then it's the father and the mother's DNA. But if it's a donor sperm cell only from the guy and goes to the lady, then it will have the father and the lady's uh, DNA. So um, quite some interesting thoughts there. I will say that on a basic level, there was an understanding of a third party carrier. Um, but Guillermo, I also saw that there was some <laughs> there were some parts that you giggled at a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of those was the gentleman who said that um, there is the DNA of all three parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I understand that there's technology that has advanced up to the point of uh, yeah reaching that point but mm -hmm. i that's at the moment that was just maybe just a thought from the gentleman there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no that's fair enough um doctor actually i wanted to ask you about the dna components if we can just talk a little bit about that and then uh just to clarify whose dna will this child end up having Sure. So again, you've got, to, you've got to divide that into which one you're talking about. So if it's a gestational carrier, by definition, there's no DNA of the gestational carrier. It's a uterus that you're actually just using for nine months, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. So in other words, the uterus is the carrier of the baby, mm -hmm. but the two components that make up the, the, the fetus, in other words, the sperms and the eggs, come from a different person completely so the carrier does not have any dna component as far as that baby is concerned okay now the true surrogacy or traditional surrogacy which is is done less frequently because it's a lot more legal work it gets a little bit more complicated means that you're using the carrier's eggs mm -hmm. so in that case 50 percent of the dna of the fetus will be from the carrier or the gestational, sorry, or the true surrogate or the tra traditional surrogate. So in that case, where you're using her own eggs mm -hmm. and foreign sperm, so to say, to fertilize her eggs, mm -hmm. and then she carries a pregnancy, in that case, 50% of that DNA would belong to her. Mm -hmm. But the most common form of surrogacy is what William has described, which is where the fetus is made up of chromosomes or genes from the man, from from a man and from a woman that is completely foreign to that carrier, mm -hmm. and that carrier just serves to carry the pregnancy, deliver the child, but has no genetic component to that child. Okay, um, and then there was also a point made by one of uh, the other gentlemen on the Vox Pops um, where he said that he thinks that perhaps the child does in some capacity carry some of the DNA of the carrier because of um, the blood exchange that's happening in the uterus. And I don't know if you caught that part, um, but please clear that up for us. I did, I did. Yeah, and there's, and there's nothing like that. The DNA is entirely made up of the chromosomes that you have at the beginning. Um, nutrients and blood definitely gets exchanged with the placenta, mm -hmm. but it doesn't change the DNA that exists for the fetus. Absolutely. Thank you for that, doctor. Um, now, I want to move over a little bit in terms of uh, discussing the medical process, right? So we understand that there's an egg and there's a sperm. These things are mixed. But um, what does the process actually look like? How does it get to be in the woman's body? Um, and then, yeah, just, just take us from there. All right. So, I mean, uh, along with surrogacy will be IVF. So it's central surrogacies you know, is, is an arm of IVF, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better word. Now, IVF means in vitro fertilization. Usually that's what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. And that means getting eggs extracted from the woman who is going to be the, um, the, the biological mom mm -hmm. of the fetus. So the way we do that is we stimulate the ovaries uh, over a period of, you know, usually 10 to 14 days, and we retrieve eggs, usually vaginally with an ultrasound-guided probe. 
get those eggs out. And then in the laboratory, those eggs are then fertilized by the stems of the biological father, whoever that combination is, so that we don't, we don't get too bogged down by, you know, husband and wife. And then those fertilized um, embryo, those fertilized sperms and eggs then become embryos, and those embryos are then transferred, usually with a catheter, into the uterus of the carrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you take the eggs out of the mom or the woman you fertilize in the laboratory with the sperms, you get embryos, and those embryos either transfer fresh or frozen, those all just depends, into the prepared uterus. So in that time, the lining of the carrier of the surrogate is being prepared to, re to receive that embryo at the right time. So there's a bit of science involved. Mm -hmm. The timing is important. And you put the embryos back at the right time, and then you know, then you've got a chance that this will then lead to a pregnancy. The pregnancy then completely is then taken over by the uterus, and then that then grows. Okay. So that's in a nutshell is how it happens. Uh, to just try, I mean, they always said the the content of the eggs, if it comes from the surrogate, then you might have a different way of doing it. So if you're looking at a true surrogate in which we're using our own eggs. She can still have IVF where we take the eggs out and fertilize with the um, with the sperms outside. But if it's our own eggs and she's got normal tubes and everything is fine, you might actually just do an artificial insemination mm -hmm. while she is um, ovulating. So you you know you time it such that her eggs have been released and then you introduce sperms into her genital tract at the right time, and the fertilization and subsequent implantation could then happen. The chances of success with that are a bit lower. Um, it's not as controlled as with IVF, but it's also quite cheap as well, a bit cheaper than IVF as well. So th that's the only case where you might not have to take the eggs out. If you're using the eggs of that same woman who's going to be the carrier, in other words, true surrogacy, then you might not need to take the eggs out. But generally, for most kinds of surrogacy that we do, the eggs are retrieved, fertilized in the laboratory, and the embryos are then put back in the uterus. All right. Thank you so much for that, doctor. Now, I want to move into um, talking about the availability of um, surrogacy services in Namibia. As I mentioned before, doctor, you are with the uh, Cape Ventook Fertility Clinic. Um, and um, That's right. they offer, well, at least, you know, they offer various forms of reproductive technologies, including IVF um, and surrogacy. But in Namibia, we know that the legal framework around surrogacy isn't something that is there, in fact. Um, so does Namibia at this moment in time offer surrogacy services? Does the clinic offer surrogacy yeah, services? Yeah, so um, they, they know, like you mentioned, there's no, there's no law, there's no, um, there's no fixed sort of guideline as to how surrogacy in Namibia should be carried out or how it's carried out. Mm -hmm. But most clinics in the world will do surrogacy based on getting a few facts correct. So the first thing is you have to have a contract between the biological parents and the surrogate. Mm -hmm. And this has to be a legal contract that is then signed by the that by both parties. So the contract that is then you know, signed by both parties, you have to see a psychologist. So you need to see the, the commissioning parents as well as the um, surrogate have to have sessions with a psychologist that goes through all the potential issues that you know could be happening in that whole journey, which could be quite extensive and quite, you know, quite trying for everybody. And so you've got to go through all of that, and that also needs to be submitted to the clinics. So those are the things that happen in clinics worldwide. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have, you know, until we have a, um, a guideline from the government in Namibia, which I believe is in the process of being put together, from what I hear, um, until that happens, we will then follow all the rules that is obeyed by all the all the clinics in the world. So those are the two things I've mentioned. And along with that will be the fact that the surrogate has to be healthy. Hmm. So in other words, you know, you've got to have a surrogate that is not perhaps 
50 years of age or 55 years of age trying to carry a pregnancy, there are sort of extenuating and circumstances where you might consider that. But usually the surrogate is younger than 42 because the pregnancy could be a problem if she's too old, she might have complications. Must be somebody who's delivered a child before, hopefully, and had a, has a child. Uh, must be somebody who does not have extensive medical issues. Because if you have already, you know, extend, you know, medical issues and you get pregnant, that could be made worse by the pregnancy. So, in other words, you got to make sure that medically, that surrogate is fit mm. to carry a pregnancy uh, without the child, well, with little chance of, uh, you know, getting into trouble because of the pregnancy. The other part of it, which is important, is that nobody gets exploited. Mm. So both sides don't get exploited. And you, you can imagine that it's possible, you know, that the surrogate could exploit the commissioning parents and the commissioning parents could exploit the surrogate. So there's going to be an, a you know, sort of agreement as to what the remunerations will be. And I see the member mentioned that in South Africa, you're not allowed to pay for that, um, which makes sense. But you have to pay for the services being offered, the inconvenience, the medical treatment, transport, feeding and all that while the woman is pregnant, delivery. And, you know, so that has to be factored in. And that's all legally stipulated so that everybody's on the same page okay. and nobody feels exploited. And then the other part of that is, you know, what happens when the child is born in terms of registration and all that. So that also needs to be discussed. Hmm. All right. Um, and then regarding the costs, because it does sound like it's, I mean, any pregnancy is, is quite costly. Um, but in terms of, you know, the legal framework, seeing the psychologist, uh, seeing a psychologist, how much does that part, aside from the pregnancy itself, how much does that part of the surrogacy process cost someone? It's it's not cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's out of the reach of so many people based on the fact that it's that expensive. I cannot tell you what the lawyers charge. I don't know what their charges are, but there will there will be lawyers' fees as well. There will be psychologist fees, which I don't know what they charge either. But that will be part of it. And then there will be the clinic fees, mm -hmm. you know. And if you're doing IVF, just straightforward IVF. In our clinic, you probably be looking at an outlay of between sixty and sixty-five grand, mm. including medication, laboratory fees for everybody involved, and all that. Uh, so that's that's a minimum you'll be looking at. Especially, but if you're looking at like an egg donor as well, then there's an additional amount of money you're going to pay for the egg donor. Um, if you're looking at those services I've mentioned, you need to pay. So it could rapidly. Add up, you know, um, and then along with that is what you were talking about earlier, which is how do you, what do you then pay for that mom to carry the pregnancy every month when she goes and sees a doctor, mm. you know, the obstetrician that takes care of the child, the delivery and all that. So it's a whole host of things that need. So it gets quite expensive. It adds up quite quickly. So I can't give you a particular figure because that then depends on what is determined between the biological parents and the and the surrogate so that would you know but but i can tell you for sure that it's not a cheap process at all mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and then, Guillermo, I would mm -hmm. want to ask you then, um, given that it's so costly, was your medical aid scheme involved at all? Did, did medical aid pay for any part of it? Uh, no, this is not covered in, in conventional uh, medical aid. Mm -hmm. The parts that are covered are basically entailing uh, the birth of the, because that's conventional, that doesn't have anything to do with surrogacy, it's just um, a birth. Um, in our case, I suppose it was um, uh, extra expensive because we uh, we did it in in South Africa, mm. in in Cape Town. So it entailed, and also the the surrogate we met was based in Durban. Mm. So we have to also cover the expenses that uh, of travel, of travel costs. Uh, initially, we also um, wanted to do the process of gestational surrogacy through a no-neck donor, and that process um, um, was uh, we did it, and it was uh, it didn't succeed. So all the attempts, every single attempt of IBF that we did was well had a cost. Mm. 
So there were many attempts that I also can uh, tell you that have uh, that were circumstantial, uh, and then um, and then later on, then we opted for an anonymous egg donor, mm -hmm. and then uh, then we were successful. Mm -hmm. So there are several attempts that we did, um, and there was additional cost of international uh, travels. So I hope that now with perhaps this, the establishment of local uh, institutions and arrangements can um, lower the costs and make it more accessible because ultimately it is kind of like mechanisms to assist parents mm -hmm. with the right to form a family. So yeah. I think that's, I hope that uh, resources become more accessible um, soon. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned that initial the initial attempts, you were working with a known donor mm -hmm. now and then later switched to an anonymous mm -hmm. donor. So uh, talk me through that. Why did you initially want a known donor and then why did you later change your mind? Well, that was simply because we wanted to be very open mm -hmm. uh, in terms of all the people that were involved. We knew uh, beforehand that the legislation uh, in South Africa would uh, prohibit uh, for unknown egg donors to be in contact mm -hmm. with the um, with the uh, with the kids and with the parents. So uh, and that for us thought like it would be nice that uh, when the kids grow up they can have the opportunity to meet their uh, biological um, mother. Mm -hmm. But um, but I thought that I mean but that was um, that uh, with, we did it with uh, with a very good friend that uh, kindly agreed to do that. But for circumstantial reasons um, related more to biology, that um, that didn't work. So that's when we opted for um, for the unknown for the anonymous uh, egg donor, and that worked uh, quicker. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right. No, that's fair enough. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and then I wanted to ask, Doctor, um, I'm sure that per perhaps not on a national level, you might not have statistics, but if you can speak to the clinic itself, um, how many people would you say in a year come in seeking um, services for surrogacy? Uh, it's not mainstream yet, perhaps because um, of knowledge, perhaps people don't know enough about it, uh, perhaps because of the cost, like we've been discussing. So it's not the bulk of what we do. Um, but if I were to give you a ballpark figure, I'll probably say perhaps three or four a year would, at the moment. Okay. Uh, people that do approach us that want to have surrogacy done. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, it's like I said, it's a, it's a ballpark figure that might change. But, you know, look, with, with people knowing more about it and knowing that it's available and it can be done, despite the fact that there are hoops you need to jump through, mm. um, it might become more mainstream, we hope it. So, anyway. Absolutely. And I think um, there's always, there's also been this long standing notion that um, for the most part, people go to South Africa for surrogacy, but I think it might also just have been the accessibility of the service here. Um, Memo, you were telling me a bit earlier that your process started in 2014 already, um, and that you, at the time there weren't really services available locally, right? Mm -hmm. In Namibia, locally. So you, you, were, you went to South Africa. Yes, but we also, um, yeah, we were at that time uh, almost based in the two places because of my studies. So I suppose that also made it a little bit um, easier uh, mm -hmm. for us. Um, so, to, for us, it was important to 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 have the process under a framework that would be completely kind of clear and established, mm -hmm. which at that time seemed to be uh, available only in South Africa. Um, but hopefully, things are changing, including. Um, Including, I suppose, the recent uh, judgment mm -hmm. that uh, that was given on our own case. Uh, I know you don't uh, you don't want to get too deep into the legalities, but I think it it recognizes that uh, that the paternity in the in, in Namibia is not uh, on the grounds of the biology, mm -hmm. and that is really important because not only for same-sex couples, but for any other couple that undergoes surrogacy or, or uh, that is a judgment that uh, is in favor of 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 this 
uh, of, of actually you could say of surrogacy as well. Mm, yeah. Absolutely, 100%. Thank you. Um, and then before we close off, as we are getting to the end of the show, um, I'll give both my guests an opportunity to, um, if there's just anything you want to share with the public when it comes to surrogacy, um, I know that a lot of people have questions around, you know, how does it affect the psychology of a child um, to be born from, you know, someone who carried them and then be given to people who are De, uh, biologically their parents but they don't have that bodily connection there's concerns around that um, there's concerns around you know um, as the child grows up you know just thought processes mind and all of that maybe if we can speak to that a little bit um, Mimo I'll start with you because mm -hmm. you do have um, three kids now and do you have any concerns about you know psychologically when they mm -hmm. learn about surrogacy what they're going to think mm -hmm. or feel about how they were born so for us, it was really important to be always open about this. Mm -hmm. So I suppose to to not hide it and also not to pretend that um, that this didn't happen, but the other way around. So we have a very good relationship with the surrogate mother mm -hmm. uh, and her family, her direct family and her extended family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we we talked to her about our kids. We talked her kids. Our, we talked. We speak to our kids about her, mm. and we are uh, basically laying the grounds for uh, or, or keeping the options open for our kids if and when they would like to know more that they have access to this, mm. that they, get, they are free to make a mind of themselves. Um, I think it's also, uh, that's just very much... Uh, um, speaking to the issue of surrogacy but mm. in general terms speaking i'm i'm convinced that families are uh, have many different kind of constellations and constructions so i'm pretty sure that uh, that if the question emerged we will deal with it in the kind of a very loving and caring way mm. and uh, thanks to the good experience we have uh, i can say it was good it was good with not only the surrogate it was positive also with the legal team. Mm. It was a very. It was positive with the with the clinic that assisted us, and it was positive also during the birth. So I think if we would like to run our kids throughout the process, it would it would it would be a good story to tell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, that's good to hear. Thank you, Guillermo. Um, and then I'll move over to you, Doctor. If, you know, there's anything, any fears about surrogacy that you maybe want to quell in the public? Sure. So, I mean, for me, a couple of things. The first thing is that it is a good thing that, you know, there are laws available when they do come through so that everything gets governed properly because there is a chance that it gets exploited, you know, for material gain by, you know, recipients and all that and commission and parents. So there should be some, some kind of plan in place and some kind of law that guides, you know, how surrogacy is, is, is done. Um, two is to mention that it's a very sort of, it's, it's an integral part of reproduction, really, because not only for same-sex same -sex couples that we've been talking about, you, you could look at people who've lost their uteri or uterus during delivery, for instance. They have one child, and during the child birth, they bleed excessively, and they have to have a hysterectomy done. But they're young enough to still have ovaries, and they want to have their own biological kids. So those group of patients will be left without an option. You know, she can do surrogacy. Mm -hmm. So that's just one. And there's some women who are born with um, with a uterus that is, doesn't exist. You know, um, I'm not going to go into details, but you can have certain conditions that you're born with that doesn't allow you to have a uterus that could actually carry a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it could be either quiet reasons why it's not happening or or reasons that you were born with that you can't actually change, but you have ovaries that can work. Mm. So, you know, when you look at that, you definitely want to give, make it available. There are potential, when you're talking about what happens to the child, you know, we all know, you know, how children could be quite sensitive about things, but I think Glamour's approach as to being open is probably the way to go. I mean, this is 2021. Mm. You know, it's not like we're sort of 30 or 40 years behind where things like this are not being discussed. These are things that should be spoken about, even at 
primary, secondary school level, for people to understand that we're all here, whichever way, one way or the other, we all belong where we are, if you know what I mean. It doesn't matter how you get there. So I think people need to understand that. And um, in fact, you know, I guess shows like yours does help to bring that to the fore and, and hopefully people begin to open their minds up to these kind of possibilities and don't stigmatize, you know, sort of kids or parents that, you know, that have to go through this sort of process. So, yeah, that's those are my, my concluding remarks, really. Thank you so much, Dr. Ola Rogan, and thank you so much, mm -hmm. Guillermo. I really appreciate that you took the time to discuss this. Um, to our audience, if you're tuned in via the radio station, Desert Radio 95.3, you can always catch this show again on Facebook. It will be under our videos. And to the audience that is watching us live, thank you for joining us in the studio. As always, please put your thoughts in the comments. We will look at them, follow them up, pass them on to the relevant specialists. And as always, we appreciate your viewership. As for us in the studio, I'm your host, Arthur Shikongo. Good night.